Well, welcome back everyone to a, another video in close reading. I'm Adam Walker and today we will be reading Shakespeare's Sonnet 55, which unlike the previous two sonnets we've read, uh, is less humorous and is actually one of the more stately uh, sonnets. One of the major themes here is that of immortality, which we saw crop up in, in the earlier sonnets. Here it is again, this idea that poetry can make someone immortal. Uh, and this comes from Horace's Odes and Ovid's Metamorphoses, but there's a difference in the way that the Greek poets conceived the idea of poetry bringing immortality. They thought it would bring eternal fame to them. Um, Shakespeare here changes that a bit. Instead of the immortality coming to the poet, the one who's creating, Shakespeare, or the, the narrator, or the speaker in this sonnet, is actually immortalizing his lover. So that's something that's interesting that's going on here and plays with this idea of power, what exactly is going to, to last. So let's turn to the sonnet. Not marble, nor the gilded monuments of princes shall outlive this powerful rhyme. But you shall shine more bright in these contents than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time. When wasteful war shall statues overturn and broils root out the work of masonry. Nor Mars, his sword, nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record of your memory. Gainst death and all oblivious enmity shall you pace forth. Your praise shall still find room even in the eyes of all posterity that wear this world out to the ending doom. So, till the judgment that yourself arise, you live in this, and dwell in lovers' eyes. So we notice here, um, structurally, that we have four closed quatrains and a closed couplet. Usually we have a closed couplet with Shakespeare. We saw in the last video that um, a rare occasion in which it was not a closed couplet. And by closed quatrains and couplets, I mean uh, one that uh, ones that have a complete sense here. So there's four lines, all one sense, governed by one period each. Uh, period here, governing the quatrains and then the couplet. Now in this first quatrain, we have the use of alliteration here, not marble nor the gilded monuments, and he begins in the apophasis, which is to begin with a with a negative. To it's a rhetorical device that puts forth the negative before moving into the positive. So what it will not be, not marble nor gilded monuments of princes, shall what? Outlive this powerful rhyme. So he's speaking of this sonnet as the powerful rhyme. Uh, monuments are, of course, set up in the memory of someone else to keep their memory eternal, usually princes. But the speaker says, but you shall shine more bright than these contents, than unswept stone, besmeared with sluttish time. But you, he says, to his lover, shall shine more bright in these contents. Contents, of course, like a table of contents, you've heard of that. That's uh, what's contained within a text. And so what's contained in these contents, in the contents of this sonnet, than unswept stone besmeared with sluttish time. And here we have Shakespeare's, one of his favorite topics, that of comparison. He says to his lover that you will shine more bright than unswept stone of monuments of marble besmeared with sluttish time. Now the word sluttish today has a, uh, a sexual connotation that's not really present here in this sonnet. It, it's, he's really just talking about something smeared or besmirched. And we have more alliteration. When wasteful war shall statutes overturn and broils root out the work of masonry. Again, the comparison against word to stone or craft or visible craft. Broil means war, strife, turmoil, and war shall wear out masonry, whereas these words shall, shall not be worn out nor Mars, who is the Roman god of war, nor Mars his sword, nor war's quick fire shall burn the living record 
of your memory. So unlike the stone, continuing with the comparison here, unlike the monuments, the marble, the stone, the masonry, these words contain a living record of your memory. Against death and all oblivious enmity shall you pace forth. Your praise shall still find room even in the eyes of all posterity that wear this world out to the ending doom. So posterity, future generations, um, the lover shall pace forth in this sonnet, and his praise shall continue even in the eyes or in the opinion of or in the estimation of all future generations, posterity. And there's, there's a beautiful rhyme length here uh, that almost makes this a rhyming couplet. Well, it does make it a rhyming couplet here. Uh, and there's like a hidden quatrain. I'm not sure if that's really a thing, but it's something I noticed um, because it's, it's the end of quatrain two, the beginning of quatrain three. But this rhyme binds those two senses together in a way. The ending doom, of course, is the apocalypse. Something, too, that's behind all this is uh, Shakespeare's indebtedness, I think, to Hebrew scriptures and the, the Hebrew um, idea that the written word shall carry forth the record of divinity. Uh, Immanuel Kant will go on to say that what makes Hebrew poetry, Hebrew scripture, the Old Testament, so sublime is the second commandment, the injunction against making images or building monuments of God. Uh, instead, the Hebrews have written a record which has become the Hebrew Bible. And through that, their God has outlived all the others. And so, in a way, I think Shakespeare is secularizing this idea and applying it to love poetry. It's something that he does quite often and explicitly in other sonnets, as we'll see. Uh, something to keep in mind that's not necessarily within the sonnet, but is surrounding it with context. So now we come to the couplet, So. Therefore, we have the logical word here. So till the judgment that yourself arise. What does he mean? Well, he's talking about the resurrection of the dead, rising to judgment. Again, notion of uh, Christian apocalypse. So until you yourself arise to the judgment, you live in this, meaning what? This powerful rhyme, and dwell in lover's eyes. So this is, this is interesting. Remember, live. Um, how will he live in this sonnet? Well, it's a living record, and he says he will pace forth with eternal praise. Well, eternal in the sense as, as long as uh, things will exist up until the apocalypse. You live in this sonnet and dwell in lovers' eyes. But it's an interesting sonnet that really takes up this theme of immortality that I think we, we saw in Sonnet 15 and a few of the earlier sonnets as well. This is one of the most famous ones, and I think the, the chief immortality sonnet of Shakespeare's sequence. So I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And until next time.